the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce announced that four presidential candidates have nominated their leading economic policy experts to present each party's economic policies. Tourist numbers continue to surge rapidly, but the relevant authorities engage in moves to further strengthen Sri Lanka's burgeoning tourism ties. The Colombo Stock Exchange sees a partial recovery as the recent negative sentiment begins to ease, resulting in mixed outcomes for the indices today. And the European Commission cut its proposed tariff on imports of Tesla cars built in China as it broadly maintained other planned punitive duties. From Studio 24, here's Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has announced that four presidential candidates have nominated their leading economic policy experts to participate in a debate on each party's economic policies and pledges ahead of the 2024 presidential election. The debate is scheduled to take place on the 29th of August at the Brandaranaika Memorial International Conference Hall. Minister Shahan Sema Singha will be participating on behalf of President Ranil Vikram Singha, while Dr. Harsha De Silva will represent candidate Sajid Premadasa. Anur Kumar Desanayaka will be represented by Dr. Harshan Surya Peruma and Professor Ranjit Bandara will represent candidate Namal Rajapaksha. This event hosted by the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce is titled as Defining the Vision, the Debate. The debate will be moderated by the Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Dumin the Halangamur and Board Member of the Ceylon Chamber, Ms. Kasturi Chellaraja. To be conducted from 9am to 10.30am, it will commence with each representative presenting their key economic policies, followed by a moderated question and answer session that will delve into a critical analysis of each party's economic vision. As Sri Lanka prepares for the upcoming presidential election, it is paramount that voters are well informed about the economic policies that will shape the future of the nation. The Minister of Power and Energy, Kanchana Vijay Sekhar, stated that a net profit of 93 billion rupees made by Sri Lanka's state power utility, the Ceylon Electricity Board, was used to settle their outstanding debt. Minister Vijay Sekhar said on social media platform X that the net profit of the CEB for the month of June 2024 has been utilised to pay the outstanding amounts to renewable energy developers, thermal power plants, coal procurement, local suppliers, dues to major projects, rooftop solar and short-term banking facilities. Vijay Sekhar said in a post titled CEB Profits and Balances Clarification that the electricity consumer tariff has been revised and reduced considering the other profits are settlement of the payments. Interim accounts showed that the Sidon Electricity Board reported a profit of 34.5 billion rupees for the three months ended on the 30th of June, which is a 67% jump compared to the 20.7 billion rupees in the same quarter last year, despite a fall in the revenue. The profits came from a lower financial expenses and falling cost even as a tariff reduction and reduced revenues. In a move to further strengthen Sri Lanka's virgin tourism ties with Poland, the Sri Lanka Tourism Promotion Bureau welcomed popular Polish celebrity couple Mrs. Azeri Pazura and Ms. Edita Pazura to the country. Meanwhile, according to the latest data from the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority, the total number of foreign tourists who have arrived in the country during the year 2024 so far has exceeded the 1.3 million mark. Mr. Ceseri Pasura, a renowned Polish actor, and his wife Editha Pasura arrived at the Bandaranaik International Airport in Colombo on the 19th of August 2024 on a Qatar Airways flight. The visit of this influential Polish couple is a part of the SLTPB's strategic efforts to promote Sri Lanka as a premier tourism destination among Polish travellers and encourage them to experience the wonders the country has to offer. As of the first 19 days of this month, the number of tourists arriving in the country was reported as 117,825, bringing the total number of tourists to 1,315,884. Meanwhile, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka has stated that during the first seven months of this year, the tourism industry has managed to generate foreign exchange earnings amounting to 1.88 billion US dollars. Let's take a short break now. This is a nightly business report. Welcome back to the nightly business report. The Columbus Stock Exchange experienced a partial recovery today. 
as a recently emerged negative sentiment slightly reversed, leading to mixed results in the indices by the close of trading. While the oil share price index ended in the red, the S&P SL20 index managed to rebound, closing the day in the green. For a detailed summary of today's trading activity, we now turn to Netmi Fernando from First Capital Holdings. Thank you, Sanvi. The Columbus stock market ended in red for the second straight session, dragging the index down by 0.1%, primarily driven by two major stocks, namely SINs and LOLC. However, the S&P SL20 halted the day in the green zone. The ASPI experienced mixed sentiment since the opening of the session with sideways movements and closed the day at 11,482, losing 12 points, whilst majority of defensive shares witnessed price declines across the board. However, the banking sector counters experienced a revitalized buying interest during the day. Meanwhile, with the mixed participation of retail and high net worth investors, turnover stood at LKR 547.3 million, marking a 30% decrease from the monthly average, standing at LKR 781.3 million. Furthermore, Sampath contributed 20% to the overall turnover. The banking sector dominated turnover by 32%, followed by the capital goods uh, and food, beverage and tobacco sectors jointly contributing 38% of overall turnover. Foreign investors turned net sellers, recording LKR 0.6 million amidst low participation. Data from the debt office showed that Sri Lanka's three-month and six-month treasury bill yields were up at today's auction, while the 12-month was down, with all offered 120 billion bills sold. To get the details inside on today's bill auction, let's connect Tarosha Shogar from First Capital Holdings. Yes, uh, today we saw a mixed sentiment at the treasury bill auction where the weighted average yields of three months and six months bill continue to increase. Where one year T bill marginally came down by two basis points. So CBSL offered LKR 120 billion at the auction today and accepted the entire offer with 63% being accepted from three month T bill. So three month bill saw a relatively smaller increase in terms of uh, yields by three basis points to 9.42%, while the six month bill increased by 12 basis points and closed at 9.8%. And the one-year T-bill saw a marginal drop of two basis points, yet still closed about 10% mark. And notably, three months and six months bills saw an oversubscription amidst higher reception, while one-year bill was undersubscribed, with only 740 million was subscribed. So during the day, the secondary bond market continued to see buying sentiment on the mid-tenors, predominantly on 2028 to 2030 maturities. And for the week ending 23rd August 2024, CBSL has LCAR 114 billion worth maturities to settle bills, while LCAR 120 billion has been raised fr from primary auction during the week. Gold prices steadied in Asian trade today after hitting record highs this week as a prospect of the lower U.S. interest rates battered the dollar and spurred more flows into the yellow metal. Spot gold rose 0.1% to $2,515.44 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in December rose 0.1% to $2,553.35 an ounce. Spot prices hit a record high of $2,531.72 an ounce yesterday. Broad metal prices also advanced, benefiting from a softer dollar and falling treasury yields, although their pace of gains slowed amid a broader risk of move in markets. Oil prices moved little in Asian trade today, seeing little relief from recent losses as industry data signaled an unexpected build in U.S. inventories, while progress towards an Israel Hamas ceasefire remained in focus. Brent oil futures expiring in October steadied at $77.21 a barrel, while West Texas intermediate crude futures were flat at $76.61 a barrel. 
Crude prices were nursing steep losses in recent sessions on persistent concerns over slowing demand in top importer China. While the prospect of easing tensions in the Middle East also saw traders attach a smaller risk premium to oil. Caution before an address by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell at the Jackson Hole Symposium later this week also kept oil prices on edge. The Sri Lankan rupee has further weakened against the US dollar as of today, according to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. The rate to buy US dollars has risen from 294 rupees and 36 cents to 295 rupees and 20 cents, while the selling rate of the US dollar has increased from rupees 303.57 to rupees 304.45. Additionally, the rupee has depreciated against a range of other foreign currencies, and let's focus on the exchange rates now. Short break now. Corporate sector coming on the other side. This is a nightly business report. Welcome back to the nightly business report. SLT Mobitel, the national ICT solutions provider, has reported a moderate revenue growth for the first half of this year while demonstrating savings through cost management initiatives. The first half performance establishes SLT Mobitel's reliance and adaptability in a challenging market environment. The moderate revenue growth coupled with successful cost-saving initiatives has led to notable improvements. The group's revenue for the first half of 2024 reached 53.5 billion rupees, marking a 1.6% increase compared to the same period last year. Gross profit at group level has also increased by 4% to 20.9 billion rupees with the gross profit margin expanding to 39% from 38.1% in the previous year the moderate growth was achieved despite challenges in the market such as customer churn and less demand for new connections the group's earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization for the first half showed an increase of 17.1% reaching 18 billion rupees while operating profit surged by 54.5% to 3.6 billion rupees. The EBITDA margin improved significantly to 33.6% from 29.2% in the first half of 2023, reflecting the group's ability to enhance operational efficiency while maintaining service quality. John Keels Holdings PLC, a leading conglomerate in Sri Lanka, has successfully completed the delisting of its global depository receipts program from the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. In an official filing with the Colombo Stock Exchange, the company confirmed that the entire process of terminating and delisting the GDR program has been finalized. This move follows the company's earlier announcement on the 16th of November 2023 where it disclosed its intention to terminate the Global Depository Receipts Program. The decision was driven by the relatively low number of GDRs in circulation, which rendered the program less effective in facilitating significant trading of the company's securities. As such, the GDRs were no longer seen as a vital component in the broader context of the company's capital market strategy. Global Depository Receipts are financial instruments issued by companies in international markets to attract investors from outside their home country. These receipts represent shares in a foreign company and are traded and paid dividends in US dollars, making them an attractive option for global investors. However, in the case of John Keel's holdings, the GDR program had ceased to play a substantial role in their overall market activities, prompting the company to streamline its operations by discontinuing the program. The Melbourne Group announced a significant leadership transition, with Ms. A.G. Kumudika Fernando being appointed as chairman of the group, with effect from the 15th of August 2024. This appointment follows the recent passing of Mr. A.G. Ratnapala Samarvira, the previously serving chairman of the Melbourne Group. 
Kumudika Fernando, who has served as the managing director for over a decade, is eminently qualified to lead Maliban into the future and continue the legacy of the Maliban family. Kumudika is dedicated to ensuring that Maliban continues to set the benchmark for quality in Sri Lanka and beyond, while also fostering a more diverse and inclusive workplace. Chat Holdings PLC recently released its financials for the first quarter of the financial year 2025, noting strong growth in both its top and bottom line. Accordingly, revenues rose by 3% to 2.2 billion rupees compared by the same period in the previous year, driven by noticeable growth in the wood coatings and paint brushes categories. Profit after tax also demonstrated significant growth, expanding by 77% year on year for the quarter under review to record 124 million rupees, up from 70 million rupees in the same quarter of the previous year. These achievements were driven by steady and growing sales, supported by efficiencies arising from JAT's acrylic binder and alkyd resin plants coming online earlier this year. The group expects these efficiencies to further support growth and profitability in the coming quarters, with it now producing binders for wood coatings and wall paint emulsions in-house. Together with further strengthening of its R&D, marketing and Bangladesh operations, it's expected to have significant positive outcomes for the group's balance sheet and financial performance indicators through the financial year 2024-2025. Jat Holdings PLC is the market leader in wood coatings and paint brushes in Sri Lanka with a dominant presence in the paints and luxury home and office furnishing segments. Allianz Lanka, a part of the global giant Allianz SE, is committed to road safety with a special focus on the safety of children on the road. In line with this, Allianz Lanka conduct annual programs to distribute child safety helmets for children. This is because many school children who travel on motorbikes often do so without helmets which puts this group of road users at a high risk. Accordingly, Allianz Lanka conducted its third consecutive annual Child Safety Helmet Distribution Initiative, highlighting its dedication to the safety of children on the road. This year's initiative is once again supported by the Sri Lanka Police, building on a long cooperative partnership with Allianz Lanka established over the years. 1,200 helmets will be distributed to students across 25 cities on the 26th, 28th and 29th of this month. This builds on previous such initiatives which witnessed the successful distribution of 1,500 helmets in 2022 and 1,000 helmets in 2023. The main helmet distribution events will take place at various Allianz Lanka branches across Sri Lanka. Each branch will host an official ceremony to distribute helmets and raise awareness about the importance of road safety. Hatton National Bank PLC recently announced its partnership with the Sri Lanka Tennis Association as sponsor for the prestigious 109th Sri Lanka Nationals 2024 Tennis Tournament, which kicked off on the 16th of August. This partnership reaffirms their commitment to fostering sports development and nurturing young talent in Sri Lanka. The tournament, scheduled from August through September, is set to showcase the country's exceptional tennis talent across various age categories, including junior, senior and wheelchair events. The tournament will feature competitions across 17 clay courts at multiple prestigious venues, including the Sinhalese Sports Club, Army Tennis Courts, Police Park Courts and the SLTA Courts. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Asian stocks retreated today as strength in the yen spurred a further unwinding in the carry trade, while losses in e-commerce dragged down Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index. Regional markets tracked overnight weakness in Wall Street as U.S. stocks snapped an eight-day rebound rally amid some caution before an address by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell later this week. China, Shanghai, Shenzhen, CSI 300 and Shanghai Composite Indexes fell about 0.2% today. 
and were in sight of recent six-month lows. Japan's Nikkei 225 and Topics indexes fell about 0.8% and 0.7% respectively, as strength in the yen weighed. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index was one of the worst performers in Asia today, losing 0.7%. Wall Street's main indexes closed slightly lower on Tuesday, ending a multi-session rally in which stock bounced back from a steep sell-off driven by recession fears. Wall Street's main indexes closed slightly lower on Tuesday, ending a multi-session rally in which stocks bounced back from a steep sell-off driven by recession fears. The Dow and S&P 500 ticked down close to two-tenths of one percent each, and the Nasdaq shed more than three-tenths. Investors are laser-focused on what interest rate clues Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell may offer Friday when he speaks from the central bank's annual economic symposium in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. While most investors expect a 25 basis point cut in September, some are wondering if it will be double that. Stocks on the move Tuesday included cybersecurity firm Palo Alto Networks, which jumped more than 7 percent after it gave a fiscal 2025 revenue and profit forecast that was above analysts' expectations. And shares of Eli Lilly rose more than 3 percent after its weight loss drug ZepBound was shown to drastically cut the risk of developing type 2 diabetes in pre-diabetic adults. The European Commission cut its proposed tariff on imports of Tesla cars built in China as it broadly maintained other planned punitive duties inset in July on Chinese-made electric vehicles. The European Commission made changes to its duties on imports of Chinese-made electric vehicles on Tuesday. It means Tesla is set to get a reduced tariff on its China-built cars exported to the European Union. The revisions are part of draft findings issued by the bloc's authorities in the highest profile EU investigation of alleged Chinese subsidies. The Commission says the proposed tariffs are needed to level the playing field and counter what it says are unfair subsidies. It set a new reduced rate of 9% for Tesla, lower than the 20.8% it had indicated in July. Tesla had requested a recalculation of its rate to be based on the specific subsidies the company had received. The Commission said Tuesday it had verified the US company received fewer subsidies from the Chinese government compared to the country's EV makers Brussels had investigated. It said it still believed Chinese EV production had benefited from extensive subsidies and proposed final duties of up to 36.3%. It's slightly lower than the maximum provisional duty of 37.6% it set in July for companies that did not cooperate with the EU's anti-subsidy investigation. Tesla was among the companies classed as cooperating with the investigation. The Commission said the three companies it had sampled would each receive slightly lower provisional duties. Chinese electric vehicle giant BYD now has a rate of 17% while Geely has 19.3% and Saic is the highest at 36.3%. The planned tariffs are a draft of what could become the EU's final measure on Chinese-made EVs once its investigation finishes in about two months. The proposed final duties will be subject to a vote by the EU's 27 states. China has launched a challenge at the World Trade Organization. The Commission has estimated Chinese brands' share of the EU market has risen to 8% from below 1% in 2019 and could reach 15% next year. It further says prices are typically a fifth below those of EU-made models. That marks the end of today's bulletin of the Nightly Business Report. We'll see you again tomorrow with latest happenings across the business world. Until then, I'm Sonia Mulanayaka. Thank you for watching and have a good night.